Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hi, I'm Becky Parker Geist. I'm the host of the Audiobook Connection podcast, Behind the Scenes with the Creative Teams. I'm also president of Bay Area Independent Publishers Association and the CEO of Pro Audio Voices, providing audiobook production, distribution, marketing, as well as podcasting services. And today I have with me Tamara Shiloh, author of the series for children, Just Imagine, What If There Were No Black People in the World? The first two in the series, Jackson's Magical Adventure with Black Inventors and Scientists, and book two, Jackson and Kevin's Black History Trip Downtown, are available in audio, as well as in print, with coloring and activity books and journal Tamara founded and is the owner of the Multicultural Bookstore in Richmond, California, and is host of Once Upon a Time in Black History podcast. Tamara, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's always nice to see and talk to you. Yeah, it's going to be fun. So let's help our listeners just get to know you a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started on your publishing journey. Well, we don't have that much time, so I'll (laughs) give you the short version. (laughs) Let's see, about 20 years ago, I just started learning how to use Microsoft Publisher. And so I started writing little booklets for friends of mine who had businesses. And I received an email one day about all these Black folks, these inventors and scientists. And 20, 25 years ago, we weren't real sure about the Internet, so... I went to the library to see if the information was true, and I'll be darned. (laughs) It was. (laughs) And I decided, wow, I'm going to write a book. And then when it dawned on me that the book would be probably six inches thick with all the information Mm. that I could provide, I decided to create a series. And so I did. And I did it with the interesting thing. The only, it was really just a little thin, maybe 12-page pamphlet, and then I graduated to maybe, I forget now, 30 pages or so. But it was all clip art, and while I was living in Las Vegas, a friend of mine was a graphic artist, and so he did the, the covers. So the book sold pretty well because of the information, mm-hmm. and people were just really interested in learning about black folks that we had never heard about and who had done some incredible things. And so it just became fun to do that. And fast forward, I joined BAPA. And I was just telling a friend of mine yesterday, after that first meeting, I had never known what overwhelmed felt like. (laughs) And I could not believe what I didn't know. And I didn't know I didn't know. And the people were so warm and welcoming. And I, oh my gosh. And so that's it. I met you, of course, and we did the audio book and people really enjoy that. Yeah. And then it led me to teaching. I have a nonprofit, Just Imagine Kids. So with having written those books, I decided to teach after school and to offer Black History after school class and summer And then, most recently, I created a course for teachers. It's a Black history course for educators, showing them how they can incorporate Black history into their curriculum all year without really having to change anything, because at the end of the day, it's American history, U.S. history, but you can't teach what you don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Were those first books, the first ones that you wrote, were they always directed just target audience was a a younger was children or not yes yeah initially it was for children Mm -hmm. yes and it still is yeah actually it's just that teenagers can use it as resources for they want to write a term paper or something right they'll have some new material other than the usual five or six right 
And so you've you actually have been doing a lot of writing. What other I know you mentioned a couple other things that you're Yeah. Up to. While in Las Vegas, I wrote for a couple of magazines there. Mm-hmm. And here I write the Black History, the weekly Black History column for the Post newspaper. I think he's in five cities or so. And I do a blog and I send out, I try to send out once a week a Black History milestone to my newspaper newsletter subscribers. I love those. I get those. And it's always a delight to open up and read about someone else that I hadn't heard about and yes. darn well should have. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't. Well, there you have it. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the way our history is taught. Yeah. It's so thrilling to have this impact, this really movement that you're helping provide materials for and provide education around. It's so needed. So just a note of appreciation right up front for all the work you're doing. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I think um, Black children need to be taught about inventors and scientists, folks that they can feel proud about knowing or coming from that race and other children should know because I think it when other kids know then it forms relationships good relationships and respect yes. because now they won't assume that everything they see and do was created by a white person now they know an African-American or somebody else some other culture created things so it, they can be open-minded yeah you know about stuff yeah I know when I first saw your books and we were starting to talk about how to approach the audiobooks, we took a really different, I still think, very fun approach to the the audio. And if you would, leading into that, if you would just share a little bit about the story concept with the Jackson books, that would be helpful. Well, when I learned all of the things that Black people had invented, then I started thinking about well, what would be the easiest way to teach kids. And I thought a storyline would be a really good way of doing it. And Black people had invented enough things where I could do what I did. So the first book is about things that Black people have invented or improved around the house. And my great-grandson is the character in the book, and it just made it more fun as he's experiencing these things as he walks around the house. And then there's a magical necklace that allows him to see and talk to the inventors and scientists as he walks around the house. And Karen Fisher Golden is my editor, and uh, she helped a lot in bringing it all together and adding some purpose other than learning about the history. But Jackson had a stuttering issue, and so he overcame that. And then in book two, we went outside and started talking about uh, many of the things that Black people invented outside of the house the mailbox flap and fishing rod and things of that nature. So that was fun. And then the lesson there was about bullying from his cousin. So right. oh, he had to overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was just fun. I've done, I've actually written all f- five of them, but now I have to rewrite them because of the characters. And then I also now have to reprint because my great grandson now is in the ninth grade and he's almost six feet tall so <laughs> the way the illustrator had put him inside of um, photoshop photoshop so now i'm just gonna go find an animated character mm-hmm. and that way i don't have to worry about that anymore yeah. so yeah hopefully i can get started on the third one next year once i get started i think again i think i'll just blow through all of them yeah. so i won't have to worry about this time thing it's, you really have to be dedicated or find some time that you can dedicate to writing and i would say every day yeah yeah but the pot audio made it really fun when i did when i would do um book read alouds here because they could hear it yeah as i'm turning pages on the screen so yeah what we did is that because in the story these inventors and scientists pop into his life Very suddenly, they just appear as a result of the questions that he's asking with this magic necklace. It seems, oh, well, the perfect thing would be to have those voices pop in. So we used, it was a multi-voice project. And then, of course, we had 
sound effects and that helped bring that all to life as well. But I thought that was, it was a really fun way to approach the audiobook and very much fit the style and storyline. Yeah. Yeah. There's just so many things you can do with audiobooks and they, they don't all have to be one narrator doing everything. Sometimes that works well and sometimes uh, there are some other really creative things that can, we can do. Yeah, I read audiobooks now or I listen to audiobooks now. You really get into it. A few of my authors have changed uh, narrators and I've written them and let us know what happened to swords because they were so perfect. Yeah. And now you've changed, but yeah, it's fun. I really enjoy listening when I'm playing it to the kids yeah. when they come here. Yeah. yeah. Now, I know it's been a little while since we created those audiobooks, but it just, if you can think back to that time, was there anything that, that you recall that seems was either most surprising thing or that kind of most stood out to you about the process overall or like what it took or how it turned out, any of that? Does... Okay. <laughs> so being transparent. Yep. Remember when I got the first draft? Yeah. Or you could say, and I'm listening to, you know, I didn't know it was a lady, but anyway. And so I asked her, is she black? <laughs> you <laughs> I do <didn't say>, remember. <laughs> I'm like, well, could you tell her to put some more bass in her voice? Because, oh my gosh, I'm like, my character, he's a young black boy, not a young white boy. And right. I don't know. But anyway, she did. Yeah. And it worked out fine. But other than that, I, I guess because... No, it was really simple. If I didn't like something, I just tell you, I don't know if I wrote something and maybe that's not the right word. It was simple. It was a lot simpler than I thought, even though I worked with you for a while. But when you do it on your own, no, well, no, I did work with you then. As a matter of fact, that came afterwards. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it was really a simple process. That's why I will have all my books be audio books. It just makes sense, especially children's books. And yeah. If you're in an organization that does story time, it's so cool to be able to put that on and then you can just flip the pages on a PDF version of it. It just makes sense. Yeah, it was fun. I don't recall any problems that other than that, and it really wasn't a problem. It was, yeah. I just thought that was fun. It was fun. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, that I had to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just take a short pause. We'll come back and continue the conversation. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70%, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to earn more from each sale? Pro Audio Voices hears you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify Audiobooks. A program that provides an actual 65% royalties of the sales price you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them and build your community and following, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Create coupon codes or schedule a sale with promotional pricing. Amplify Audiobooks gives you the tools to effectively market your audiobooks and a much higher return on every single purchase. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com or go direct to ProAudioVoices.app. And for listeners, visit AmplifyAudiobooks.com to find your next great listen. The Amplify Audiobooks app is now available on both app stores. Let's talk a little bit about going back to some of what we were talking about earlier and focusing a little more on the impact that you're having in the world. How would you describe that, the impact that you are having or even, or that you're intending to have? What is it that you would really like to, the difference that you would like to make? Well, I would like that folks not make such a big deal about Black history. Because like I said, at the end of the day, it's, American history, U.S. history, American government, all of those. So my thing is when I'm talking to teachers, it's, look, you can't teach what you don't know. I get that. Yeah. But this is not difficult to do. It, it's 
if you just give it a chance. And because the timeline of American history coincides with Black history, then being able to integrate it into whatever curriculum you're doing is easy, even social studies. So I just, I don't like the idea that they're trying to dismiss it because you can't dismiss history. It, it just doesn't make any sense. And right. I don't, in my books and in my classes and the course, I don't talk a lot about slavery because I'm more interested in people knowing about the contributions and the accomplishments that African Americans have made. And I want to focus on that for children because they're going to hear enough about slavery throughout their lives and throughout schools, but they aren't hearing about the good things. And so I think I just want it to be normal. You just teach history, which is inclusive. Even tell the teachers when you're teaching black history, you don't have to say, okay, today we're going to teach black history. No, today we're going to teach about Garrett Morgan. It doesn't have to be singled out, and it really shouldn't be. It's just a part of our fabric of America and Europe, actually. Yeah. 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 And tell us a little bit about your bookstore. I know it's been a journey, especially with COVID hitting when it did. Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced along the way and where you are with it right now, what kinds of programs and such you're doing? It started out with three of us. The bookstore opened in 2017, and it it started out, it was just supposed to be a a pop-up for November and December. And we did so well, the mall asked us to stay. And the lady that actually provided all the books, she didn't want to do a brick and mortar. She worked conferences and seminars and things like that. So then that left two of us. And then Robin decided she wanted to just work her nonprofit. So that left me. And the entire time when we started this project, we'd always decided that it was going to be a multicultural bookstore. And it was the multicultural children's bookstore. Yeah, children's bookstore. And then after I took over, people were saying, because we did have other books and why we called it children. I guess that was initially what we thought we were going to do, but it made sense mm-hmm. to add all the other genres. So I did. And and then it just became the multicultural bookstore. So let's see, 2018, 19, I was in the mall and then COVID hit. And so, of course, we had to shut down, but then the mall decided to sell the mall. And so I had to find <laughs> another place, right? And yeah. so... I'm now sharing a space with the Bay Area Girls Club here in Richmond, and my store's in the back. And it's really nice. We have a patio. We have a huge yard for the kids to play in. We have a gazebo. and It's really nice. So what helped me out during during COVID, Oprah's online magazine did an article about supporting Black bookstores. And my bookstore was one of the bookstores that she highlighted. And she actually had a map on the page, and we were actually pinned on the page. And that was really nice. The online bookstore component was just by chance. My cousin in Sacramento was telling some ladies that her cousin had a bookstore, and they wanted to order. And it's, okay, how do we do that? (laughs) And so I called Square, and they were like, oh, yeah, that's easy. And yeah, then we open then we started the online store and the 49ers found me and by way of oprah's magazine article and so that was a good relationship and then people started seeing or hearing about the bookstore because you really couldn't see it and owning a bookstore you won't be buying groceries or paying the mortgage or any of that car notes (laughs) but the sales of books you have to think outside of the box yeah I don't even think Barnes and Noble could pay their lease with just selling books. I don't know. But at any rate, so then you start getting creative. I started having book signings. Of course, I knew a lot of authors after BAPA and right. the other groups that I joined. And so we start doing that and story time. And then, like I said, I started, oh, then the schools, then I started letting the schools know that I'm here and they really like it. And the one thing about the store that kind of set me, I think, apart 
But some of the bookstores, even though now I notice a lot of them have taken it up, is my covers are all face forward. So when a kid walks into the bookstore, they see themselves on book. Mm-hmm. And Latino children and African-American children, you hardly ever see that. And even yeah. though Barnes & Noble has a really good selection of Black children's books and Latino children's books, you don't see the book, you see the spines. So if you don't know mm-hmm. the name of authors or the name of books, then, you know, you don't know it exists. So right. I'm really happy about that. It does mean that I can't put a ton of books in the store because the covers do take up a lot of space. But I prefer right. this. Teachers love it because now they don't have to pretend like they know every the name of every book or author, <laughs> right? Because right. they don't, just like yeah. me. I don't want to either. But so it was very easy for them to come in and select diverse a group of books. So we have everything Asian, South Asian, Latino, LGBTQ, graphic novels, African American kids, fun books, chapter books, Black history books, mm-hmm. diversity, disability, STEM, language, music, dance, and art. I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, awesome. <laughs> that is- we just want to come. Oh, and teen and adult. So we try to accommodate everyone. I don't know every author or every book that's out there, so I always appreciate it when folks come in and ask me if I have a book or if I can get a book, and I do. And mm-hmm. I add it to the inventory because it just makes sense. And right. so, yeah, it's been tough. That The last, what was it, a strain or whatever it was, that kind of set me back a little bit because we thought we had come out of it, and here six months later, here we go again. <laughs> so yeah, I'm COVID. still trying to... Yeah, I'm trying to crawl out of that. And I think, I think I'm going to do okay. I have some good relationships with some of the nonprofits. The Emerson Collective, they've been very good about buying for me since they started buying two or three, a couple of years ago. So that mm-hmm. helps out a lot. That's a Steve Jobs' wife's nonprofit. And yeah, so working with the schools and other nonprofits. It just yeah. helps keep the doors open, and I don't yeah. plan on closing the doors. You have to be consistent, and I'm learning that, too, you know, about yeah. what you do. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to love it. So, that's good. That's good. And if you could let our listeners know where they can find you, what's your website, best way to reach you? The website is the com, and the email is multiculturalbookstore at gmail.com. To hear the podcast, the website is once upon a time in blackhistory.com. And I'm also, I guess I can share, I'm opening a bookstore in Las Vegas and we're hoping to open in October. Everything goes well. So we're real happy about that. Mm-hmm. My friend, my girlfriend, Carol Santiago, and I are partnering on that venture. So we're real happy about that. That is very exciting. News. Yeah, it is. A lot of work, but yeah. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. If someone needs to chat with me about anything oh, for the course for educators, it's teachkidsblackhistory.com. If there's anyone out there interested in taking that class and they can get me my name, Tamara Shiloh at gmail.com. So great. And we'll put the, we'll put all those links in the show notes so that people can find you more, okay, more cool. easily. Super. And then, of course, your audiobooks will be very soon available. Actually, by the time this airs, will probably be available on Amplify Audiobooks, where we can increase the impact, your impact, through that platform. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Tamara, thank you so much for being with me. This has really been delightful. Oh, my pleasure. It's always good to see and chat with you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.